One of the first things that Brother Tony said that caught my attention was the fact that Paul could have launched right out into the difficulties that were associated with the Corinthian church. There were a lot of them. There was abuse at the Lord's table. These brethren were not living harmonious one with another. Some said they were of Cephas. Some said they were of Paul. Some said they were of Apollos. So there were a lot of difficulties, and he could have launched right out and dealt with those things, but he, but he addresses those things from a high place. And you said that. And I'm thankful for that, because a profitable conversation is the product of living in a high place, in a high heavenly place. It's so important that we recognize that and be very aware of where you are abiding. Brethren, where are you abiding? Where are you abiding? Are you continuing to abide where Christ seated you? Where God seated you in Christ Jesus, he set us in the heavenly places in Christ. You know, there's nothing that you ever have to address by leaving those places. Yeah. Yes. Everything can be addressed from heavenly places, right. no matter what you have to confront. Okay, And that's so important to see. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, one of the things he said is this, Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you giving yourself to a system of religion that accentuates the earth? Why are you doing that? <laughs> and if we're not careful, you can do that. It doesn't take long, and you can be back on the earth again. And we don't want to do that, brethren. A profitable conversation is the product of abiding in heavenly places. So let me just give you some examples of profitable conversations. And these are all men, I think... I think the Lord, brethren, this is a side note, but I think the Lord has raised up this assembly to justify the names of godly people who have, who have had their names cast through the mud by particularly Babylon's. So just, Babylon is a blasphemous thing. And it's taken holy names and brought them down into lower places so that men don't feel so guilty for living so low. Men like Abraham and Moses. I don't mean to, to get off on a side note, so, but I just want to encourage you with this. This is a good thing to continually remember the conversations of godly people and to hold them up where they belong. Men like Abraham. You know, Abraham, it said of him that he staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Abraham could have been just abiding on the earth. No, just been focused on the fact that I'm 100 years old, Sarah's 99. How is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? He could have been wringing his hands all the time, wondering how this is going to happen. But Abraham did not consider that. He didn't consider his weakness. He considered the strength of God. See, he lived as high as he could, which means he lived up to what God had declared God was going to do. And that enabled Abraham, through that promise, to conduct himself continually in his life in a consistent manner that brought glory to his name. And I'll tell you, if you look back at this, you'll see this. Everything that Abraham did, whether it's rescuing Lot or leaving Ur or offering up his son, it was all the product of his remembrance of the promise of God. That's part of faithfulness. You don't forget what God has said. And that remembrance enables you to live holy in this world. Moses. Moses was faithful in all God's house, and it was kind of a hard house to conduct himself around. But I'll tell you, Moses, when he, dec when he said to God, he, he made this supplication, show me your glory. And when God passed by him and declared the name of the Lord... What he heard at that point enabled Moses to be faithful in all God's house. Moses never forgot. Even though he came down the mountain and he confronted great disappointment, I'll tell you, it is hard, brother, to confront people that are living on a low place when you've been living in high places. This is a difficult thing. But he did do that, didn't he? Yeah. But although Moses had to address these things, Moses never forgot what God had declared at that time. Never forgot the glory that he revealed, and that's what made Moses faithful in all God's house. Moses could have just been thinking about those hard Israelites all the time, and he didn't ignore them. I mean, the book of Deuteronomy ought to confirm that, brother. He just let them have it. But that's not all Moses thought about. 
He thought about the fact that God was a God of love and kindness. Mm -hmm. And he thought about the fact that God was abundant in goodness and truth. And he thought about the fact that God will not acquit the guilty. And those are the things that enable him to be faithful. He lived as high as he could. Our preeminent example is the Lord Jesus Christ. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he could have been utterly caught up in the most difficult thing any man has ever had to face, bearing all the sin of the world. And he didn't ignore it because he prayed about letting that cup pass. And I know he didn't ignore it. But what enabled G Jesus to pass through the cross was the glory that was set before him that was on the other side of that cross. See, he addressed that cross from a high place, from the joy that was set before him, knowing that this would leave a testimony to the world that he loved God, knowing that this would be the means by which God's purpose would be forwarded, see, knowing that this would be a means by which he would have a bride for himself, see, all those things were things that were moving him to bear the cross. He lived in this very high place and enabled him to be productive in his conversation. So let me encourage you with at least that general exhortation to live as high as you can, which means this, live up to the truth that God has given to you. Don't forget it. Amen. And there are all kinds of things that you're going to face something Monday that's going to, that's going to demand your attention, that's going to encourage you to forget that. But don't do it by the grace of God. Remember what he's promised and what he's called you to, and you'll be able to walk profitably. Now, more specifically, you've been called to holiness. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That sounds like a qualification, doesn't it? That sounds like a qualification. Men today have greatly confused mercy and grace. When they talk about the grace of God, they leave the impression with you that they can live an utterly unprofitable life in this world and somehow, by the grace of God, obtain the things that God has prepared for those that are faithful and that really love Him. I'm astounded by this. Grace is about being productive. Grace is about living a profitable life. And grace is about living holy and separate. God has called us to... A separate life. Now let me give you just two reasons why, do, why we are encouraged to do this. Because that's part of living by faith. You live for reasons, for godly reasons. There are reasons why we, we don't live mechanically. Okay, we live on the basis of a persuasion. Now let me tell you, why should we be holy? Well, because Peter said it this way, As he which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. When do you know of a time in recorded history and scripture where God has ever acted in a way that's not holy. In fact, this is the father of lights with whom is no shadow of turning nor any variableness. And this is most exemplified in the death of Christ Jesus. Because at this time, God did not spare his own son. God did not act unrighteously. He didn't. He didn't spare his son. He was holy. And so be ye holy. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will God walk with someone that's unholy? Do we have any record of God walking with someone that's not holy? And yet men to do, today actually believe that he'll do this. No, he won't do this. As he which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now look, let me give you this last thing. When Paul was commissioned, he was commissioned to turn men from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now this is kind of a new consider kind of new for me tonight. I haven't seen it quite in this light, but but certainly we understand this. Holiness and righteousness is requisite, brethren, to being a faithful steward of the inheritance that's prepared ahead. It's requisite. It's required. Think of this. The world in which you'll dwell is a world wherein dwells righteousness. 
how can a person who has cultivated themselves with unholiness in this world be ready to obtain the inheritance there and to be a faithful steward of it if that inheritance is going to unfold in a world where it dwells righteousness? Think of this. We are going to sit with Christ in his throne. Remember, one of the chief characteristics of his throne is righteousness. Yeah. His is a scepter of righteousness, and he rules in righteousness. How can you possibly, brethren, how can you possibly be a co-laborer together with Christ at that time with him who is a righteous ruler if you have cultivated yourself by the defilements of this world and haven't lived separate and holy? That isn't even possible. Yeah. And every man is cultivating himself and where they go will be determined based on how they've cultivated themselves here. Now, brethren, you have been called with a holy calling because you have a holy inheritance, so to speak, that's prepared for you. So don't be disqualified by that inherit for that inheritance by cultivating yourself through unholiness by living in an unholy place while you're here. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. You are prepared for an inheritance that's up ahead that will involve being with Christ where he is and will involve dwelling in a world wherein dwells righteousness. So all these things in mind, let us by faith take hold of this good exhortation that Brother Tony has given us tonight and to live sanctified and separate from the world. Amen. We don't want any regrets in the day of judgment. Amen. And if you have lived holy here, you will have no regrets there. I open it up, brethren, for your comments tonight.